The films of Richard W. Munchkin. Let's do it. Sex. Loose women. Drug. And things. Who the hell are you? This just pool. Take a check. The films of Richard W. Munchkin. Right, so the people who are um, joining the channel today will already know the gentleman that I'm interviewing as I'm doing some watch parties of his films. Um, there is a trailer up on the channel soon um, that will show why I'm such a massive fan. We're talking about writer, director, professional gambler, <laughs> podcaster. Um, just all round um, talent, Richard W. Munchkin. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Sure, sure. Happy to do it. I really do appreciate it because I don't even know where to start because there's so many of your films that I enjoy and I know that people who watch the channel enjoy as well. Um, but you're, one of the things I didn't mention too much in the intro there was your background in theatre and acting um, is something that really you know, sort of took this, uh, was the beginning of this Hollywood journey, I guess. Yeah, my original intent was to go to Hollywood and uh, become a movie star, of course. And uh, I, I had a backup plan. If that didn't work, I would be a television star instead. And <laughs> my background was in theater. And uh, when I got to Hollywood, I learned pretty quickly that the film and television business in how it uh, treated actors was not the same at all and realized one day, wow, you know, this is not what I want to do with my life. Um, you know, actors were treated so horribly. Um, and so I, and it was kind of an existential crisis for me at that point because I had spent my whole life thinking, I want to be an actor and then got there and I was like, no, I don't. Wow. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and I happened to be in the right place at the right time. And, um, you know, was friends with Joseph Merhi and he was making his first movie and said, will you help? And I said, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and so was able to transition over onto the other side of the camera and and that's kind of how I ended up writing and directing and producing and and oh, a lot. Do you think some of the sensibility from your background in theater influenced? And this is a strange question for people maybe looking at your IMDb, but I can see some of that in films like Ring of Fire, the the kind of almost the Romeo and Juliet side of it the you know the classical storytelling that's in there is that something you brought with you from your theater background do you think yeah oh absolutely that and and the i think the way that i was able to communicate with actors in the film uh mm. trying to get the best performances possible out of the actors i was working with having come from that background i think helped tremendously uh, you know, as far as uh, Romeo and Juliet and Ring of Fire, that uh, that was a direct strip uh, steal. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> the the story on on Ring of Fire was uh, Joseph uh, called me into his office on the beginning of December, and he said um, we want to do a film in February, and um, we'd like you to direct it. Do you think you can? 
be ready in that amount of time. And I said, well, <coughs> excuse me, you know, that's not a lot of time. You know, can I read the script? And he said, right after you write it. And uh, so I was going to Chicago for the holidays and I called my brother and I said, look, I'm going to be there for two weeks. We need to write a kickboxing movie. Neither of us knew anything about kickboxing. I said, rent all the videos you can find. And <laughs> uh, and we will just take something we already know works, right? Romeo and Juliet with kickboxing. And basically like West Side Story, except instead of yeah. dancing, they're kicking each other. And uh, Yeah, that, 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 co that comes across. I, um, almost the, the dance side of it as well. There's a real dance... Um, you know, obviously, the, your, your first film, Dance or Die, but the, the, yeah, there's a kind I, of there's, there's a dancing element to fighting too. Yes, yeah, yeah, absolutely, there is. Um, and um, my when before I moved to Los Angeles, one of the things I was doing aside from gambling in Las Vegas was uh, producing dance shows for Japan. So we right. would have six or eight dancers and maybe a singer and uh, send them to a resort hotel in Japan for six months. Um, and, and that's um, part of why uh, there was so much dance involved in uh, Dance or Die. Right. That's really interesting because obviously in I can, now you've said West Side Story as well. I can see that within the, the gang elements of, uh, of, Ring, of, of Ring of Fire. Um, and obviously, Don the Dragon Wilson, ha having somebody with that legitimate background, but also I think has a real um, upright citizen uh, uh, sort of a, a screen presence, you know, somebody who seems very honourable and, um, you know, leading man quality. Th that must have been a, a really interesting experience, having him there. To, to anchor that film because um, obviously Johnny Wu goes on to be in a, quite a few films. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it was, you know, my first time working with Don. It was a pleasure working with professional mart martial artists just because they are so disciplined. And I think for, you know, uh, in martial arts training, they're used to, you know, sort of having a sensei that, you know, tells them what to do and showing him respect and listening to him. Mm. And, and uh, uh, you know, I, ju I just found the martial artists were so easy to work with. Um, oh, yeah, because actors, that's not always true <laughs> with actors. No. But, uh, no, not but being they, able to they, were, they were great. Don in particular was, yeah, he was tremendous. That's really interesting you talk about. The, the, I guess it is that the, being able to take instruction in a way that is um almost like like you say like a sensei to pupil kind of kind of way it make, makes perfect sense that they would be able to take some direction dur during making of a film and is is that the reason why often people work with you more than once you you, you know somebody like say gerald okamura um you know and and, and don wilson pe people like that that you've worked with um art camacho people like that who you, you you just worked out early on that these people are great to work with yeah i think any director does that when you find people that are you know easy to work with and good to work with and have a good time working with you want to bring those same people back all as as much as possible and and i'll give you one example in ring of fire um uh, the detective was played by an actor named Michael, Michael Delano. Um, I, I'm trying to remember his name was Garcia or, or go. Um, oh, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, Lopez. The cop. Lopez. 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 Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so um, Michael Delano, we were shooting a scene in Chinatown and the, the sun was just starting to come up. We needed it to be dark. So we were in a mad scramble and it just started to rain. And we were finishing the last, his close up 
and I forget who he's talking to, might have been Don, but um, uh, so we were like, we need to do this right now, right now. Go, somebody go get Don just to be standing off camera to feed him the lines. Right. And Michael said, uh, look, we don't have time. The sun's coming up. Just roll, have the script supervisor, just read the words to me. And oh, wow. we shot the scene that way. And he and he did it great. And I was just like, you know, here's a guy who understands the big picture, right? I mean, there are yeah. many actors who would insist <clears throat> on having the other actor, you know, there with them. And we may never have got the shot. And I was like, you know, this is a guy I want on any movie I do. Yeah, and he's, he's gone on to have a really, a really interesting career, hasn't he? He's been in so many like um Ocean's Eleven and Commando and oh, like yeah. a real he, he, so he that was attitude on, uh, has served him well. Yeah, the television show Rhoda. Um, you know, he was a, oh. a recurring character uh, as Rhoda's boyfriend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's had a he's he's had a very long and good career, and um he actually lives about one mile from me and um oh. He, well, I noticed he, uh, Casino Host was was one of the um, he's played Casino Host and Casino related people in quite a few things, and I wondered if he was based in in the Las in Las Vegas. Area he is now, around. yeah, he, yeah, he is yeah. now. So that's interesting. So, so to to sort of move on to the next, because I'm I am a massive Ring of Fire fan, and the second one really took me by surprise. I remember watching it the first time because it's so different to the first one. The underground element. The um, t tell me the thinking in, in in that. Did you just have um, um, was it was it a real collaborative effort where you were getting other people coming to you with different ideas? Because Johnny's obviously still there. Um, but beyond that, the the stories, the story goes in a wildly different direction. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> you know, working. <laughs> Working at PM Entertainment, there were, were always very strange constraints on whatever you were doing. Right. And in this particular case, <clears throat> PM had uh, leased a abandoned sausage factory in downtown LA. So it was this massive, massive building with all kinds of different looks to it. And they basically were like, we want to shoot the whole movie in this building, right? right. <laughs> so, or as much of it as you can, as much as possible. Okay. So uh, <laughs> that's where the idea of doing the whole thing underground came about. And uh, a, a movie that I always really loved was a movie called Warriors. Yeah, and uh, in that movie, Warriors, which is taken from a a, a um, Greek uh, uh, story about warriors who were trapped behind ancient Greece, um, right. and I believe it was a true story, but they were trapped behind en enemy lines and and had to make their way, you know, back home. And yeah, like uh, a classic so, tale, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So so that was sort of the impetus for all the different gangs with the different costumes was, was from that movie warriors and mm. um, uh, the idea of, you know, having to go into this uh, underworld and uh, you know, and save, uh, save the wife. Yeah. Well, that, that, that I certainly, now you say that and I can, there's the, certainly the radio, like the rebel radio, um, you know, the, the kind of almost commentary on what's happening. There's an element of that from that that reminds me of Warriors as well. And, and right. Well, and the, that's the, really the, the, the Greek chorus, right? Mm. Who in classical Greek theater, uh, you know, there was a chorus who, who would kind of uh, uh, speak from above it all. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And, and, and like... Um, the, the, the things like that, I think that's what makes the film stand out to me is that, for example, and I'm kind of jumping a lot, bound, about a little bit, so hopefully you'll, you'll indulge me a little <laughs> with it. But, um, for example, in films like Out for Blood, 
where there's like there's there's definitely some comedy elements in there um whether it's um the british accent uh, and i always say her name wrong but uh, shari shuttuk um shattuck the, yeah shattuck right see i knew i'd say it wrong <laughs> um the, like her accent and and some of the interplay uh with don wilson in 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 that um that the, that's not you don't see that in a lot of action films like time isn't given to that sort of character development whether it's romance whether it's comedy whether it's um was that do you think that's something that you uniquely wanted to put in your films you wanted to make it more of a well-rounded film and not just a a sort of um we go from one fight to the next fight to the next fight yeah absolutely i mean i'm always trying to put humor into whatever i do um and uh, you know, and and to tell you the truth, if I mean we were making action films, that's that's what it was at that time. That's what would sell. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but if somebody had said, you know, here's a free ticket, what kind of movie do you want to direct? I would have said romantic comedy. Right. Like that's sort of where my sensibilities lie. And, and I think you see that in Ring of Fire. The I mean the romance part of it. You know what I mean? So yeah, I yeah. I was always looking to try to put the, those kind of elements in if I could. And, you know, I was, um, uh, well, anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. So to answer your question, yes, I, I was always looking to try to uh, do those kind of things. And, um, you know, I remember with the English accent, I, I remember just saying I, I wanted some kind of accent. I wanted something about the woman to be different. And right. uh, so when actresses would come in, I would say, do you do any accents? And whether it was a Southern, you know, accent or whatever it was, and I would just try different things. And, and um, yeah, I, you know, the one interesting thing about that movie was um, for Out for Blood, now I'm talking about. Yeah. Tia Carrera came in to audition for that movie. Oh, and wow. it was it was just before Wayne's World came out. Yeah. And um, you know, she was just about to take off. Now Don knew her because they had been on a soap together. Right. And oh. um, so when she came in, she gave a fantastic audition. And I went to uh, Rick and Joe, who own PM Entertainment, and I said, you know, this girl is fantastic. And, you know, this movie Wayne's World is about to come out. I think this would be huge if we could have her do this. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, Joseph said, you know, we can't have t an Asian female and male lead because people think it's a Hong Kong movie. Oh, man. And <laughs> and you know, so I, I, I mean, Sherry Shattuck did a great job. Don't get, get yeah, me she wrong, did, she but, did. She, um, she, she's memorable for sure. Like yeah. her character is memorable. Their banter and back and forth reminded me a bit of like your classic um, odd couple. You know, two people constantly bickering in an old school kind of way. Um, like a Rock Hudson kind of <laughs> yeah. film or something. Uh, you know, another interesting thing about that movie was um, that movie came from uh, Don and his manager, a guy named Paul, and they had come up with this idea and they wanted to call the movie Karate Man and they wanted it to be a kid's movie, PG-13. Oh. And, oh, okay. you know, they had ideas of having action figures and, and turning it into a franchise and um, again, you know, PM, they were like, no, it's got to be R. You know, we, we don't do kids movies. They don't, kids movies don't sell. You know, it's got to be darker than that. And, and uh, you know, wow. so, so that's what it ended <laughs> up. That's wild. I can understand now why the name Karate Man is mentioned so much throughout the film. Like it, it, it is, <laughs> it is said a lot, isn't it, during the, <laughs> during yeah. the film? Um, so yeah, that 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 the tone of that film, yeah, it, it is is definitely uh, different. And, and I was going to ask that because obviously I saw that that Don Wilson had a 
it's as based on a concept by um so yeah that that kind of explains that one that's really interesting so um if i can kind of jump around with other films and and and, and sort of dis discuss um diff different you know films that you've done i i noticed that a lot of the people that you've worked with um later on as well do have that legitimate sport background whether it is you know someone who has worked in judo uh, sorry um took part in judo or whether a boxer like like ray mancini or um you, you know like we say don don wilson or or even like people who very very physical like jeff winkart it, it was that something that was always in your mind you were like you know obviously you had those parameters from the production company of what sort of films you were making did you think oh thank god i've looked out by getting a hold of these people who are very passionate about what they do and 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 just you know some of them are absolutely at the top of their game uh well so <clears throat> So the stars of the film would be given to me by PM, right? Right. You're this is gonna you're Jeff Wincock is starring in this movie, or Cynthia Rothrock is starring in this movie. Right. Um then for people who had to do a lot of fighting or physical things, um, you know, a guy like uh Stephen Vincent Lee or um, well, and any, any of the people that, um, uh, Gary Daniels or, you know, they had to be legitimate martial arts people. Um, and, and those people would basically come from Don and Art Camacho. Art Camacho became my fight coordinator before he became a director in his own right. But in the mm -hmm. beginning, my, my first fight choreographer was Eric Lee. Um, and Art was his assistant. And um, Eric Lee was in Ring of Fire, you know, obviously as the, um, I've forgotten the name he had in the movie, but uh, he was sort of a comedic element um, oh, that yes. yeah. uh, was on the crutches at one point. Anyway, um, Art was much more sort of detail and organizationally uh, adept. And, and so for the movies after that, Art became the fight choreographer and he would bring these people. So, um, right. okay. you know, uh, so that's where so many... Now, Stephen Vincent Lee, you know, he was in Ring of Fire, so I knew him. So, um, yeah. but, but so yeah, 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 a lot yeah. of the speaking part, I mean, a lot of the fighting people would come through Art and Don, but then the, the rest of the actors were people that I would either just cast out of my head <clears throat> like mm -hmm. a guy like Michael Delano or I, or, you know, I would audition. Right. Cause like somebody like uh, Eric Lee, you know, when you, you look through his, you know, whether it was stunt work or in big trouble in little China or Rambo and um, uh, a lot of the people, and I suppose the, 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 the one who you, I can't, you, you mentioned there in terms of, um, you know, Art Camacho going on and, and making movies and also being stunt coordinated. A lot of these people are coordinating the stunts on other people's movies now. That must be really interesting for you to kind of switch on the TV and see that they're sharing those skills and, and, and showing those things that you saw in them 20, 20 plus 30 years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean... Um... Ron Ewan also went on to, you know, he shows up in, in uh, very big movies now and is uh, doing some directing. And um, yeah, a lot of people uh, that started out, you know, Gary Daniels, I think, got his SAG card on Ring of Fire. Um, right. So Because he's English, isn't he? he he's, he's from England. Is he English or Australian? Yeah. Oh, maybe. Because I, I know that he's in The Expendables, and I think he has a name like the Brit or the Limey or something like that, but then that, <laughs> that, that, that could quite well mean that you're Australian. But to Americans, <laughs> they don't know the... You yeah. Know. <laughs> you could be South African. And they would... Yeah, the, the Brits. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and like you say, Ron Yuan with um, Mulan and, and films like that, that that he's gone to do. So um, 
it, it, maybe we're not necessarily in well, in that age now where you um, directors are given a name of an actor and then build the actor film around them. Like you say, you're making a Jeff Wincott movie or you're making a Cynthia Rothrock movie. But actually, your creative license beyond that sounded like you were able to do some really interesting things that you wanted to do. So, for example, Guardian Angel feels like what like a a film that um, comes from your mind. It ties in for me with Ring of Fire because you've got the two characters who have, at first, nothing in common, don't like each other, um, and, and, and sparks fly. Guardian Angel feels like that too. Um, it also looks like, looks like a really fun film to make. It's very bright to look at. There's tons of action, but also a lot of interplay. Like you see Cynthia Rothrock's character use a lot of humour. Um, what was your experience making that film, Guardian Angel? Well, um, first of all, I have to go back to the idea of wanting to make romantic comedies at heart, right? I mean, yes. that is kind of the formula for a romantic comedy is two people who, who don't like each other at all who end up falling in love. Um, so, you know, when I could add those sort of elements, uh, I, I would. Um, and I didn't write Guardian Angel, so, um, no. you know, that uh, it's a different thing. But that doesn't mean that I didn't have the ability to sort of, you know, add things when I could and and things that are there for me, you know. Yes. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, again, a Guardian Angel was like a classic PM Entertainment story because they came to me and, um, and, and said... Uh, look, there's this woman who is huge in Japan. And, you know, Japan is a major market when you sell these films overseas. So this yeah. woman <clears throat> is a cigarette boat racing champion and she's huge in Japan and it'll, you know, really sell the movie in Japan. So we have to put this movie, I mean, we have to put this woman in the movie. And now, you know, I was used to Las Vegas where, you know, the producer has some girlfriend that you have to put in the show. And so, you, you know, she can't dance, <laughs> but you put her in the back. And, and, yes. but, but George, who was in charge of the sales at PM, was like, no, 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 no. She has to have a major role in the movie. And right. I said, okay, but there aren't really any major roles for women in the script. And, um, Anyway, uh, um, I mean, she was a lovely lady, but so that whole cigarette boat chase at the end with the helicopter, which was really an amazing thing to film. Yeah. Um, so that was her boat and, and she was the police captain and she's the one driving that boat. It's like, okay, you have this woman and you have her boat and you have to put them in the movie, right? Now yes. we got an amazing action sequence out of it and... I mean, that water was freaking cold that day. And, and um, you know, both her and Cynthia, I remember, you know, just diving in and doing the work. And I was like, oh, my, I felt horrible for them. That, like, you know, because they must have been freezing. Um, yeah, well, anyway, yeah, it's, it's a cool, that, it's a cool that's sequence. what I remember uh, a, lot, a lot about that uh, uh, movie was that I had a little scene in that movie where uh, Cynthia uh, kicks me out of her trailer and, um, you know, and that movie shows up periodically and somebody will say to me, oh, I saw you, you know, in this movie. Um, that so. was on my list, actually, to mention about director cameos, because I believe you're in a, a couple. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. You show up in Fist of Iron as well. You know, I, I think I show up in almost all the movies, but often right. uh, you don't, you know, I maybe I don't say anything, but, it, you know, it was sort of like an Alfred Hitchcock, you know, I'm going to. Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah, I, I, was I think laugh. in Ring of Fire 2, I'm some homeless guy with a shopping cart underground in the dark with the <laughs> Christmas lights all over the shopping cart. Um <laughs> that's wow. amazing that I, I would i think most people would do that who have a passion for film and you know also you know hitchcock being the the master of that it, it, it's um it's just such a fun thing to be able to do if you can't have fun while making your movies or what then 
what absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. So um, as I kind of move through, obviously Guardian Angel is one that that is a big. I, I see it as like a kind of big, bright film. There's lots of you know um, swimming pools and parties, and he obviously he's a playboy, isn't he? So he's um, you know he, he he kind of flaunts his wealth. Um, but as we kind of move on to 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 other films as well, and I won't go through every single film, but there's so many great great films that I'm interested in asking you about. Um, but but the people that you work with along the way, some of them you continue to work with again. And then other times you were working with people that were, were certainly big names or were names that people recognize, whether it was Sam J. Jones or um, even later on working with Corey Feldman. The, these present different challenges, I guess, the more that you're working with people who um, are known or, or not? Did they just approach it in the same way as the as, as the martial artists? Um, <clears throat> well, Sam Jones is another one of those guys like Michael Delano that you know I would go, I would work any anywhere, anytime with him. He he is the kind of guy. Uh, I ended up doing a TV series with him uh, for Animal Planet uh, called Hollywood Safari. And, oh, and yeah. Sam is the kind of guy, he is the kind of guy that you're, um, you you have to shoot, let's say, up a big hill in the middle of the forest or something, and, and there's no road to get the equipment up there. And so the crew is carting equipment, and Sam is the kind of actor that is going to grab things and start carrying up the hill. And, and, right. you know, That's and the crew cool. would say, Sam, Sam, no, we'll do that. And he's like, no, no, I'm going up there anyway. And, you know, he would, I mean, he's just that kind of guy. He's fantastic to work with. Um, That's awesome to hear. Cause, cause to me, it's what he's always going to be Flash Gordon, you know, like uh, that was <laughs> what I was, I was brought up on. So it's great to hear that Flash Gordon's a great guy. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Fantastic guy. Um yeah. Uh, really you know, cool. now Corey has had a, a lot of his own issues in the past. Um, he was fine for the most part to work with. He was fine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to crap on anybody. There's really no, no, no. When no, I no, think no. about it, there's only one person that comes to mind. And I, I'm not going to name them. Her. That's fine. Um, <laughs> That's not what I'm about either. To be honest, I'm not. Yeah, I'm, I'm about... yeah. But there, there no. was only one who um, was really a problem, and um, and and basically had some kind of mental health issues. Right. And right. Um, and and it's difficult when you're trying to move so quickly. Uh, you know, when you have someone that that has issues, and mm. um, you know, I so I was lucky in that regard. Part of that maybe is, um, you know, that I had a good sense in auditioning people. Uh, right. you know that that they were because you're almost a ringmaster, work. aren't you? When 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 you've Absolutely. got all these, or you've got all these to to mix metaphors, you've also got. Plate, lots of plates spinning at the same time. That's a um, perfect metaphor. And, you know, and I have to say, the first movie I did was called Dance or Die. And mm -hmm. all of my um, experience on these film sets had been, I was kind of the production manager on, like, the first nine City Lights movies. PM became, City Lights became PM. But, um, so I was like the production manager. I was doing things like making sure vehicles were going to be there and costumes and props and things like that, organizational stuff. Mm -hmm. And then the first time that I was going to direct, um, I came to, I shot the movie in Las Vegas. I came to Las Vegas. I was doing all that organizational stuff. And mm -hmm. I remember Joseph, um, you know, came before we started filming and on the first day of filming, <clears throat> um, we walked onto the set and the director of photography looked at me and said, where do you want the camera? And I, my, I just froze. I was just overwhelmed because there were people coming up to me just nonstop. Do you want the blue shirt or the brown shirt? Where do you want this uh, chair to be? <laughs> you know, just nonstop questions. And then like 
where do you want the camera? I was like, yeah. uh, uh, I was like a deer in the headlights, completely yeah. overwhelmed. I'm and, managing personalities um, within that, like we just, like you were just saying. It, it, hopefully most people are amenable and do what they're supposed to do, but then there might be what that one person who's having a really bad day. Yeah. Yeah. Now, fortunately Joseph was there and sort of helped me at the beginning get rolling. But, um, but so on when ring of fire, the next movie came about, I was like, I'm going to be so freaking prepared. Um, you know, I, I'm going to know the answer to all of these questions and um, yeah, so anyway, uh, I I digress. No, no, that's that that is a really like I don't think people sometimes appreciate that they think maybe if somebody sort of stood with a viewfinder and everything's happening around them, but if if you're not kind of um, literally directing those things, the clue is in the name, <laughs> um, yeah. then they, they don't happen, and that's a lot of pressure. To even just taking away the elements of the personalities of the actors and the people you see on screen, um, and, and and you actually and and again this is going to kind of jump around a little bit, but you you work with um, an actor that I I just I just I just loved I, I love watching him. Um, he passed away um, a year or two ago uh, with Bo Hopkins with, with um, in Texas Payback and. That looked like a real, like even just looking at the the trailer. There's so many explosions in that film, and I've seen, yeah. I have seen it, uh, but it was a while ago. But I seem to remember, you know, how how is it directing something like that where there's a lot of shooting and fire? Because in a martial arts movie, yes, it's violent and it's hands on, but they are highly trained and highly skilled. Is it the same thing with? action do you need to get people who know everything to the nth degree absolutely yeah you 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 need really good stunt people and really good special effects people and um you know texas payback yes it was much more of a straight action movie um again sam jones because he's such a pleasure to work with um yeah and that movie I was producing as well. That was a company that I started with um, another guy, um, and uh, and and so that that, <laughs> that movie was um, tough because it was really hot. We were shooting it in June in Las Vegas, uh, most hot, of yeah. it, and um, yeah, it was. But the explosions and stuff like that, yeah. Um, I mean, that's you know, boys and their toys. I mean, who <laughs> who doesn't love to go out and blow stuff up, right? So we we were having a good time, um, yeah, even though it was awesome. it was freaking hot. Well, I um, noticed everyone's in a vest or um, I would call them a vest. I don't know, yeah, like a like an undershirt, I guess, and everyone's kind of you know sweating so yeah i it's um it, there's a film i'm trying to remember which film it is and it might be digital man or something like that the one with um patrick swayze's brother in it where they're out in the desert and everyone looks so boiling hot and texas payback reminds me of that where everyone everyone looks super hot <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um I, so, and you know i think oh, that may be my best film um you know i, I mean that might be my best film. And it was a shame because we finished the film. We sold it to a company um, for U.S. release. And that company went out of business right after we uh, right after we sold them the film. So it never got oh. released in the U.S. Right. Um, okay. It is hard to find. You know, it's not like on Plex or... Um... Tubi or, or um, things like that, where you can normally, you know, source certain films from and it. Yeah, I, I did. I did wonder about that because it, it seems as well. And, I don't, and like I said, I won't keep you keep you too long. I'm just I'm, I'm, I'm just noticing the different passages of uh, of time in the films. Whereas over time, you moved in different directions, such as um, like um, evil obsession with that sort of you know being that idea of um, Almost a thriller. Who 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 done it? Um, and and then erotic thrillers with deadlock. So 
I mean, so, yeah. So what happened was, um, uh, those thrillers are <clears throat> thrillers are much cheaper to make than action right. films, and the market had started to turn. The market was going down for these low budget films, and so that was an attempt to make films cheaper than we were making them before and still be able to turn a profit. Um, right. But ultimately, right. it turned out that, you know, it, the there was no market after a while for these sort of really low budget films. Uh, the low that, budget film became like four million dollars. And I guess there was such a, a boom after or around the time of Basic Instinct where the people were like, we can make money out of these films. Yep. Um, there's a great um, podcast um um, you must remember this where they did erotic 90s erotic 80s series and one of the things they covered was that you know absolute boom of, uh, of films around that time um that maybe it might have been that gap might have been filmed by a sort of an action film a couple of years earlier it was just yeah yeah that's yeah. really interesting you say that um and i'm going to if, so good if you look at the same formula now bloomhouse which got huge Mm -hmm. um, you know, their idea was let's make films really inexpensively. One way to do that is to shoot it all in one location. And they kind of focused on horror because that was cheap to do. But their cheap movies are like $4 million, you know, <laughs> yeah. as opposed yeah, to 400000 or, you yeah. know, we were making them <laughs> four or sometimes less. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I guess what one person's low budget is another person's mega budget. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I have, um, with the help um, of, of a couple of people, um, I, I've made like a little trailer to the season because we're watching a few of your films, discussing a few of your films. Um, and I, I just wanted to show it to you. Hopefully it doesn't em embarrass you, but um, or embarrass me. But um, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll show you the clip and see what you think. The Films of Richard W. Munchkin. Let's do it. Sex. Loose women. Drugs. And things. Who the hell are you? <sighs> this just cool. Take a check. Richard W. Munchkin. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. I hope it kind of yeah, yeah, I did. And things. and actually, I I have to um I have to point out Michael Worth, who was just another one of those guys that is such a pleasure to work with. Has become a director in his own right. Um, just a fantastic guy. So. Oh, that's good. It's good that he sparked a little memory of, of, of someone there, and uh, well, that's that's really awesome. Um, I've got to say, I didn't do the voiceover because my American accent is not very good. So my friend Don, not Don the Dragon Wilson, but my friend Don, um, who has a, a channel called Night Owl Movie Talk, he did the voiceover for that for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed watching all the films uh, and revisiting a lot of them to, to put that together. Um, and I think just to just to thank you really for all the hours of fun and enjoyment, um, and and hopefully you know it, for, one of the aims of this channel was to open up people to directors and things that I enjoy, and maybe they might go, oh, I've not heard of that film, or not put two and two together that three films they like are all by the same person. Mm. Uh, so um, I just just wanted to kind of touch on 
some of the other things that you're doing and, and your YouTube channel, I, I, I subscribe to and, um, you know, professional gambler, gambling wizard, your book. Is, is there something that you want to um, tell the, the people who watch the channel to check out that you're, um, you know, that you're doing now and that you're, that you're, well, you're passionate um, about? Obviously, your, your gambling is, is a real... Um, Interesting. Yeah. Subject. So I, I've been a professional gambler for uh, 45 years. And so I always supplemented my income, actually made the majority of my income from gambling, even when I was in film and television. I was making more money gambling than I was, uh, you know, in, in film and television. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I transitioned <clears throat> um, from low budget filmmaking into television and it was really kind of the perfect thing what what low budget filmmaking really teaches you to do is work very quickly and efficiently and that's what you have to do in television and so i got onto a show um they had me do a number of episodes the show got canceled i moved on to another show i did six episodes the show got canceled and i all of a sudden i hit a wall where I couldn't get work for whatever reason. And uh, it was kind of a shame because I really enjoyed it and I thought I was good at it. But I told at one point, I told my friends in the film business, uh, look, uh, I'm not going to beat my head against the wall and keep calling people who don't return my phone calls. So if you want me, you know where to find me. <laughs> and, and if not, <laughs> I have my own way to make a living. So, right, uh, right. but for your audience in particular, um, I have a podcast called Life is a Gamble. And I have a two-part episode with Joseph Merhi, who was the owner of PM Entertainment with Rick Pepin. And if they're interested in these films, I think they'll find his interview. It's two parts. He has an incredible life oh, story. Cool. And I think they will uh, really enjoy that. And, and coincidentally, I also, one of the episodes is with a woman named Lori Thompson, who was one of the dancers in Dance or Die and is now one of the top oh. entertainment attorneys in Las Vegas. And if you've ever heard of Glow Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling. Very much made, so, yes. Yeah, they made a Netflix uh, series about it. Mm -hmm. She was one of the original Glow wrestlers. Oh, so, wow. Um, so they might... I, I remember the original one. I mean, um, I, I remember yeah. the, the series and, and a lot of those... Um... A lot of those videos and, and things like that. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. S -s Such a change in career to, to, to yeah. Well, she had she you know had a ballet background and she um was a featured dancer in the Foley's Brigier in Las Vegas for years, but she always knew she wanted to be a lawyer. And she right. at that time there was no law school in Las Vegas in Nevada. We were the only state in the union that did not have a law school. And so wow. she would fly every day from Las Vegas to San Diego to go to law school, fly back and do two shows a night at the Tropicana Hotel in the Follies. And wow. um, that's a that's a movie right there. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it, um, an amazing story. So anyway, um, you know that that's what I, I have another podcast that I've been doing for thirteen years called Gambling with an Edge, but it's about gambling. So. I don't know if your audience is is much into that, but um... my problem is I'm I'm if I like something I like it too much. Therefore, <laughs> any experiences that I have had, I've maybe uh, had to draw a very defined line. So I don't know about the people who 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 watch the channel. I don't know about their experiences with it, but um, I'm interested in because you know particularly in in the culture of Las Vegas and. The casino, obviously, is Scorsese's casino, and um, you know, films that that kind of a, a film that even Saved by the Bell, you know, marriage and they got married in Las Vegas. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, that 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 is is it is it sort of a culture you think people still don't tap into enough in Hollywood because it seems to be there's a few films and a few series and then it stops and then the, you know is it just if it's not in LA it's not not getting made. You know, I tried 
<clears throat> for 20 years, I tried to get a gambling movie made in L.A. And um, I just could never crack it. And, and it's so rare. And most of the movies that are made about gambling and television shows are so bad. They just, they, they, I don't understand why they, if they're going to, you know, have a scene in a casino with a player playing a game, why don't they have someone who understands the rules of the game? Because they so often mm. just make ludicrous mistakes where anybody right. who's ever played blackjack or baccarat will look at the scene and go, that's not how that, you know, that's not how that game is played. Right, so the core you know? audience is switching off straight away then. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I just was never able to crack it. Because it is um, such a unique place, isn't it? I mean, and Casino, the, the, the... Casino is a fantastic movie. I mean, that that is a, you know, just a brilliant movie. And, particularly close to me because all the people in that movie that was going on when I first moved here. So, wow. you know, like <laughs> when um, Frank oh, Rosenthal's no. car blew up in, in Tony Roma's parking lot. I mean, I remember when that happened. I mean, oh, um, when the plane crashed on the golf course at the Las Vegas country club, all that is real. Um, oh, so for me, that, that movie has a kind of, uh, it's like a documentary. <laughs> yeah. oh wow that's amazing so i will encourage people to check out your podcasts i'll um i'll put links to them all and um, i'm subscribed to all your channels or, or already but i will i will make sure that i put them in the description of, to this video um just just a huge thank you like i say for all the hours and hours and hours of entertainment um that i've really enjoyed and um it, it's just been so cool to hear about how those things got made, your kind of journey from, you know, theatre to to blowing things up, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is just just amazing. So you know, um, I, I have to, I uh, I have one more story for you, and that was oh please, any you yeah know, yeah. Uh, I mean, as the movies progress, if you look at PM Entertainment and look at the movies progress, you know, we started out. I remember the first time we blew up a car, and that was like. Oh man, we just thought that was the greatest thing. Now the car was standing still, you know, a piece of junk car. And from there it went to, well, let's make a car flip over and blow up. And, and then, you know, it went to, well, instead of a car, let's make it an ambulance. And then <laughs> let's make it a prison bus. And then, you know, and then it was in Out for Blood, let's blow up an airplane. And, and and then in Ring of Fire 2, it was, let's blow up a building, <laughs> you know? So wow. uh, yeah. it, it really escalate. was just, you know, it was a lot of fun to just keep trying to figure out, like, and, and that was the other thing. George, who was in charge of sales, was like, come up with different ways to kill people, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Instead of always they get shot, come on, you know, so... So in some of the movies, you'll see just the weirdest things, like the guy has a spear gun in his apartment, and yes, and just you know the bad around. guy gets <laughs> shot with a spear gun. Or uh, yeah, oh, it was so a lot cool. of fun. That sounds it. I'm just I'm just kind of going back and thinking about you know the the business model changed a little bit. Like I, I remember getting um, a DVD from the like. I, I suppose American equivalent would be like a dollar store of Magic Kid and Bigfoot, the the um, unforgettable encounter. I actually own own those films, and as that business model changed, I guess there's less blowing up. Um, and and <laughs> it's, well, they uh, were both. They were doing both, so they started right. to make those kind of kids films. But the action films got bigger and bigger and bigger for PM. I mean, right. you know, to the point where they were closing down sections of the freeway and, you know, having these massive car chases and explosions. And um, and, and then LA Heat as well, obviously. The, the, I didn't realize that that was PM entertainment as well. You're Okay, so I, we have to talk about this. So you're talking about LA Heat, the TV series. Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. So I directed three episodes of that uh, series. I didn't come in until near the end. But um, so this was the craziest series in the history of television because <clears throat> PM. So the idea was we have this massive library of over 100 movies 
and every movie has got some big action sequence in it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take some action sequences from the movies and then write a television episode around them and cut them into the television, each television episode. So every episode, the two for the audience who hasn't seen it, it's you know like a Miami Vice ripoff: two cops, one black, yeah. one white. But every episode, they'll be driving a different car, right? And the car will go through some <laughs> massive chase, <laughs> flip over, blow up, and then the two actors will kind of crawl out and brush themselves off, and you know, <laughs> and and because they had to take some car chase scene where they were dry, they had to get a car that matched the car from the movie they took it out of oh, and uh so yeah <laughs> it was it was nuts to try to you know have this footage and say okay write an episode around this footage and yeah. make it You're all make to sense. those constraints those constraints again like you were talking about right at the beginning with ring of fire where y you know yeah. you, you get this dossier of what you have to follow um uh, and I guess that was the, the the sort of the business model in a lot of ways, regardless of the genre of film. But the business model from you know when their their first one, which I think was eighty nine, all the way through till the two thousands when it became a different uh, under a different name. Did was it Harvey Entertainment or something like that? Well, they were bought out by Harvey. Oh, uh, okay. That's why that's why you don't see these films, you know, playing late night on cable be, is because they're sitting, you know, Harvey bought them. And then I think La Harvey, I think, was bought by live entertainment. And then whoever owned it uh, went bankrupt. And so those films are just sitting somewhere. Somebody owns them, I guess. But yeah. I would have no idea who. And it's really hard to get hold of them on physical media Um C certainly, like I, I think I was showing you before, my copy of Ring of Fire, it, it, it kind of looks strange because that's, I don't remember, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't look like the same film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so somebody's made that without, made that box without really knowing what the film is about. Uh, or or maybe, yeah, maybe they don't even have the rights. They're just bootlegging it. Who knows? Uh, um, yeah, that's a good point. Who have I got? So I've got Prism Leisure on this one. I don't know. Oh, no, but P, it does say PM at the bottom as well, distributed by Pr uh, Prism Leisure. But then we're in the UK, so this is a region a region two one. So yeah. who knows? Who knows? Somebody's making something. but <laughs> Somebody did buy uh, City Lights and is re-releasing those. So, um, you know, who, I, who knows? <laughs> Maybe somebody needs to do um, a Richard W. Munchkin box set, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, particularly, Ring of Fire is, I'll go back, I always go back to Ring of Fire, but it's such a beautifully shot film. Like, it, I, I watch, say, the sort of the remasters of Jackie Chan films, and I think, like, how clearing like a 4k or even a 2k of ring of fire would be amazing it really would you know i uh, there was a um a copy on laser disc which would be excellent quality if you could still yeah. find it and have a laser disc uh uh player. you know one. um <laughs> ring of fire the 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 first ring of fire was the director of photography was rick pepin the 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 p and pm um uh. So, and, you know, he later became a director in his own right as well. But um, he, yeah, he was a great uh, DP to work with. Oh, that's great. Oh, so oh, I, I'm really, I was, that, that story about um, LA, LA, um, he is, is so funny. It's so fascinating that that's, you know, literally the plan is we've got these little sections that now go away yeah, oh, and yeah. write. <laughs> <laughs> I, and and for me or anybody who worked with PM, it is so typical of PM. Like, of course, that's what they would do. <laughs> oh know? wow, that is so good. Oh well, um, like I say, I'm going to put all the links to all all the things that you're doing. And thank you. I know you, you've not been so well recently. I really appreciate your time. Um, for uh, you know, I hope you hope you're on the mend. Um, and, and yeah, I just for I know there's going to be so many people watching this interview who are just like, oh man, I love that film. I love that film because. Already, I told a couple of other channels that you know I, I'm doing some of your films, and they're like, "Oh, yeah, that's the guy who did Ring of Fire. Oh, that's the you know out for uh, you know." <laughs> um, so yeah, it's been really, really awesome. It's been a privilege speaking to you. Thank you so much, Richard.
Sure. Happy to do it.